since lockdown, I've had to do a lot more outdoor exercise as and when I can, since the gym hasn't been open. Also, the thought of attending a class with tons of people, using equipment, even if it had been wiped down is just kind of gross. So, I've been trying to spend a lot more of my time walking. Running isn't really my thing. Bad for your joints and your knees. No thanks. But, I can walk for hours, and it's been really good on keeping the pounds off and my appetite down. Because I've been doing this for a couple of months, I'm always trying to find a slightly different route. I pop on my sneakers, earbuds go in, and off I go, out for a few couple hours. It was on one of those evenings just a couple weeks ago when I had spontaneously decided that I wanted to stay out a bit longer and head somewhere different. I try to keep on the sidewalks as much as possible, better for my ankles, and less chance of coming across any potential serial killers in the woods. But that evening, something drew me to the woods. It wasn't pitch black dark, but certainly a lot darker in the trees than it had been on the sidewalk with all the street lamps lit up. As I was power walking my way through, I had this weird feeling in my gut. It was almost like I had been drawn. I actually started to speed up a bit more, cursing myself for going in there when it was dark and I could not see well, not even knowing where the way out was. I was beginning to panic a little when I bumped into something. Since this happened, I have read many cryptid encounters to see if I can find anything similar. It definitely seems like I was pretty unlikely to actually bump into mine. Most people just see a fleeting glimpse from afar but mine knocked me off my feet, literally. It was like speed walking into a brick wall. I was stunned and terrified. My first logical thought was that I had literally walked into a tree. As soon as I ran into whatever it is I did, I fell and looked up. That's when I began scrambling because I saw eyes and a terrifying solid figure that was moving before me. I got a really good look. Whatever this was, was robust and incredibly large. It didn't wobble though. Whatever it was was solid, just completely giant solid mass. I couldn't really make out arms or legs. It must have just been what I'd hit. Then I continued to look up. This thing was around maybe eight or nine feet tall. I'm talking huge, easily double the size of a bodybuilder. It was piercing, piercing yellow eyes. When most people see monsters, they run away. But I was just stuck in total fear and anxiety. And that's when this thing opened its mouth and everything around me went into slow motion. I couldn't make out any details, but at the same time, I could. This awful screech came out. And that's when I saw the bazillion tiny little teeth that accompanied its mouth. It was a long, gnarly snout, and that's when it appeared to have little appendages sticking off of its mouth, like odd little tumorous growths, and it was scaly and gross-looking, as if you took like a giant lizard or something, maybe a Komodo dragon, blended it with the DNA of a human and a few other random animals, and then mutated it by sticking it in toxic waste. I don't know what else to call it. It was hideous the more my eyes adjusted to it. I did my best to regain composure, slowly, very slowly, crawl away. And after I got about 10 feet away, it just looked at me, strangely, as if it wasn't sure what I was doing. Then, as if alerting itself to a sound, it quickly snapped its head to its right, looked back at me, looked back in the direction that it heard a sound from my guess, and then quickly followed it. I took that as an opportunity to bail. Now, I look back at this, and I don't know exactly what I saw, but after doing some research, I can't exactly pinpoint what it would have been. Bigfoots don't match the description. Either does a dogman. 
I don't even know if I saw a lizard man. Even though it did look reptilian in a way, it was far too grotesque and ugly. What do you think of my story? What exactly could I have encountered that night? Sometimes you see something and your brain just can't quite compute. You know, like when you hear about people that have been through massive traumas. Just forget it or make up another variant of events to protect their brain. Your mind can do that too when you see something weird. You can be looking at it and your mind is just in a hell no mode. That cannot be what you are seeing. That it's not even possible. That is why I refuse to believe that I had seen a lizard man just walking down the road on the way home. I must have had more to drink than I realized, and I must have been watching the sci-fi channel too much, or so I thought. All the excuses and rationale I could think of to not accept that I had actually seen a human-sized humanoid lizard I even managed to convince myself that maybe I dreamt it. Because of this, I didn't tell anybody about it. After all, what would I say? People would think I had lost it. So when I was down to the pub a few weeks later, and one of my friends began on about his girlfriend, saying she'd seen this massive creature walking down the road, I nearly just laughed at him. He, of course, was saying that his girlfriend must have been crazy, or on something that doesn't exist, or that maybe she had been reading too many scary stories. As we began laughing and joking, to prove his girlfriend was imagining stuff, and clearly crazy, he said he was going to walk along this road on his way home, and look out for the same thing, just in order to mock his girlfriend. Since that was the way I was going, and the exact place I had seen this thing, when he was getting ready to head out, I downed my beer and told him I'd join him. I didn't know what to think. Did I want to see it? Would I prove something? Or was I hoping for some sort of really weird coincidence, and we both just had the same highly unusual hallucination? I was feeling more and more uncomfortable as my friend was just laughing and messing about. He kept making stupid noises, pretending to be a ghost or something when we both suddenly stopped dead still. We had both heard some definite movement coming from the tree line next to us. That's when he wasn't looking so good. He was muttering under his breath. It's probably a fox or a rabbit. When he was ready to be literally for anything, then this thing stepped out onto the road, and like a snake, it even hissed. It was nearly six to seven feet tall, a little bit taller than both him and I. To be quite honest with you, this thing resembled something right out of a comic book. Naked, green and scaly. Well, I think it was more brown, come to think of it. But it was clearly ugly, and it resembled what it would look like if you took a human and mixed it with that of a lizard. It was also terrifying. It had an elongated face, two sharp snake-like eyes, and large teeth protruding from its upper jaws. And with a mouth that big and wide, filled with tiny dagger-like teeth, they came a long tongue that shot out. It looked at us with such an intensity, not only shock that it was shocked we were there, but looked at us as if it was pissed that we had seen it. That was enough. We both turned and ran as fast as we could. It never did give chase. As far as I could tell, I think it just walked back where it came. But I never did look over my shoulder. Nobody else ever saw it. And they still think the three of us what it did taken some sort of wacky backy. But we know what we saw. A lizard man in the flesh. My dad is a keen fisherman and has traveled all over the country to participate in competitions. He also used to, and I stress here, used to, to try and find the way out of middle of nowhere type spots in case he could catch something that would get him instant global recognition in the cutthroat world of fishing. But you see, 
he actually did come across something. Only it wasn't a fish, and it frightened him so much. He no longer goes anywhere unless it is completely out in the open, and he is surrounded by the presence of others. This was somewhere out in Georgia where he had the experience. I'm not sure where exactly, as he refused to tell us the exact location, just in case we wanted to go looking for it. He had heard of some elusive fishing spot, where apparently the fish were huge, and there had even maybe been talk of undiscovered species of fish. That was more than enough to pique his interest, so off he went. He was going to be gone for four days. He came back after only one night, looking dead. He just walked straight into the kitchen and sat down. He wasn't really talking at first, and my mom and all of us were very worried. But then he went on to tell us that he found something that shouldn't exist. That's when my mom kept asking him about the wound in his hand, and he just said it was a mistake. It was all a mistake. Then he kind of casually just started talking out loud, almost hysterically. It was disturbing. He was telling us that he was out there fishing when a large walking alligator attacked him. When we were asking him, what do you mean a large walking alligator? He said it was an alligator, but it wasn't quite an alligator. He said it looked like one, but it walked on two legs, had bigger legs and longer, bigger arms, and nearly tried to grab him and pull him into the water. That it came after him, rushing after him in his tent. After that, we all just kind of sat quietly, not really sure what to make of his story. I love my dad, and I wanted to support him fully, but I didn't know what to think. My dad's a church-going guy. He doesn't make up stories, nor would he. And why would he cut his own trip short and come home looking like this? There's nothing for him to gain out of it. The wound on his hand, he told us, was when it grabbed him and gashed his flesh. This thing came out of nowhere, he said, what he believes was hiding in the bog, waiting for the right time to strike. He said it was larger than any gator he has ever seen, and has never seen or heard of any gators that supposedly walk on two legs. He kept calling it the Gator Man, but I don't really know what to think of it. We all, including my mother, just comforted him and just tried to listen and were there. After a while, he went to bed. Honestly, it's kind of disturbed me even to this day. We would always be there for my dad. I wasn't really sure what to make of it. Back when I was about 12 years old, I would hang around these other kids in the neighborhood. We were all kind of misfits, maybe not going that extreme. But our parents all sucked, basically. So, between me and the three other kids, we would have to find stuff to do. Usually involved trying to sneak cigarettes or trying to find stuff to do. Like places to explore. Things to stay out of trouble while also maintaining entertainment was our utmost priority. A lot of it at the time was just us trying to fight off and ward off any boredom we would come across, which seemed constant. We would find things to do, of course, break into old abandoned houses, trying to not to get into too much mischief, and of course, our favorite, hang around an old sewer drainage, which was always cool to explore, and sometimes we would find our parents' flashlights, go in there and see how far in we could go. That is until one day in the spring, where we all saw something that none of us to this day can accurately rationalize as any living thing or any living animal. Because quite frankly, what we all saw that day shouldn't exist, plain and simple. But I bet you've heard that line a bazillion times from all the episodes you have on your channel. So let me cut to it. This day, I was hanging out with these same three kids. I still keep in contact with all three of them as we have become close since our childhood. For the story, We'll call them Brian, who is 13, Don, who is 14, and Patrick, who is 12. Same age as me. I think a couple or a few months older, but that's irrelevant. So, because we were all roughly around the same age, 
we held roughly the same interest, and none of us really had video games or much to do. This was like 1992, so we had to do our best to find things to do. But there was always this one old area, past the neighborhood, that was a huge, large storm drain, or sewage drain. I don't know if I would accurately say sewage, because it never smelt like sewage. I think it was just more a giant concrete runoff, tunnel, that you can climb into. We went into it often, because it didn't appear to be in use. The tunnel was never wet, and there was debris, you know, like garbage, just from the wind, leaves, things like that. But other than that, there was nothing else in there, or so we thought at the time. No animals, no raccoons, nothing. So, we would make it a thing to see how far we can climb into there, nearly weekly. Sometimes, we'd get quite a few minutes in there, and we never did, for whatever reason, looking back, before we had this encounter, fully explored it. Once you go so far in the drain, or the tunnel, it branches off to several different areas. Maybe it's because in our adolescent minds, we got too spooked to travel further. And, after having encountered what we did that day, I guess I can't blame us. We must have instinctively knew. So, the day comes, and we do our normal routine. Walk around, complain we're bored, and so we finally made it over to the storm drain. And we even had our flashlights with us today. It must have been sealed in our fate for this to happen. This particular day, besides all the others, we must have decided to try and travel as far as we could. Because looking back, that's really the only logical reason why I think we saw what we did. So we all go in, single file, and if you know anything about storm drain tunnels of this size, they're not the largest, but they are pretty confined. At least this one was. We couldn't exactly stand up fully, so we were crouched, but not like hands and knees crouched. We were all walking single file. I was about two or three, and Brian was in front. Don and Patrick were behind me. We were making our way down into the tunnel with flashlights. Once we got so far in, there was a turn off to the right, a turn off to the left, or you could keep going straight. All three ways extended past the light's reach of our flashlights, which fed more into our eagerness to explore. And off we went. Brian chose to go down the right way, which we all followed after. I mean, now was not the time for us to split up. After going a little ways, maybe only a couple of minutes, we began to hear a tapping sound, or a pitter-pattering sound, it's hard to remember clearly what it was, but it sounded like wet feet on the concrete. Now, here we are, four of us, sitting in a completely darkened tunnel, and I think at one moment, all of us try to sit down, turn off our flashlights, and just take in the darkness around us, just for spooks and giggles. But that didn't last long, as you can expect. We were all pretty scaredy cats back then. So, continuing on, we began hearing the feet pattern, that's when all of us were trying to hush each other and trying to listen closer, with Brian being the most boisterous about shh. That's when we could hear the sound traveling towards us. We kept shining our flashlight ahead of us, but never saw anything. Brian, I still don't know to this day how he managed to summon up enough courage and bravery, but he told us all to stay put and walked off about 30 more feet in front of us. When we could see from his light, this figure emerged from the darkness facing us, walking towards us, and we all screamed and lost it in unison. The thing we saw in that storm drain defies nature and rational explanation. What we saw, I can't even describe it accurately because I feel like it's going to sound ridiculous, but it reminded me, and by the way, all of us have talked about it since and described what we think it looked like, but to me personally, it kind of looked like a half-man, half-alligator, except it resembled more of an alligator than it did anything else. Whereas Don tells that it looks more like a dinosaur. Patrick thought it looked more like a lizard kind of humanoid with sharp claws and teeth. And I think Brian's on more my side, where it looked to be half-man, half-reptilian, or half-man, half-alligator. Either way, its outward physical appearance was frightening to say the least. Enough that we all were screaming, and we all bolted out of there so quickly. If we all four were on the track team, 
I can almost bet money we would have made record time getting out of that drain. As we all jumped out of the drain, we all pretty much fell on top of each other because the drain was probably about three or four feet off the ground. You had to hold on to your hands and lift yourself up to get into it. Whatever that thing was, we all four saw it. There's no mistaking that. And for whatever reason, it never chased us. I don't know why, but I can remember all of us trying to catch our breath and Brian saying, what was that thing? What was that? And I'll never forget Don saying, I don't know, but I never want to see it again. After that day passed, we stayed away from that storm drain and never really went and played by that area again. Well, we were 12 and 14 and 13. I really wouldn't say play, but explore and mess around. Before I lose track here of my thought trail, before I sent this to you, I wanted to try and see if anybody else had seen anything similar. So I listened to a handful of your reptilian episodes, and while nothing exactly comes close, although there were a few that talked about the alligator man, which I thought is interesting, but this was in the Midwest, not in the South like Florida, so I'm not exactly sure of the correlation. But all those stories talk about reptilian beings that are easily over eight feet tall. This thing was about our height, probably four or five feet tall. I mean, it was standing upright in the drain, which is probably, I don't know, maybe five feet at most, if I had to guess. When I mentioned that we had to crouch, it was slight, not full crouching. And this thing, as hideous as it was, wasn't making an effort to charge after us or rush. It was just casually walking directly in our direction. And as soon as our light shone on it, it didn't even stop or flinch. For it, it's like business as usual and it just kept coming towards us. That's when we all fled and we took our lights off of it. But when we first heard the sound, whatever it was, that thing is what I assume it was, was coming towards us from the drain. I don't know if it heard us coming in the drain or if it was just naturally roaming the tunnels, as if that's maybe its home, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder about that story and sometimes I wonder, had we traveled deeper into that same tunnel would we have found its den, or where it lives, or even worse? Could there have been more of these things? Could this thing have been a baby? So many questions, and so little answers. Back in the early 2000s, I used to be a waitress at a very small little dinky hole-in-the-wall restaurant outside a small town in Iowa. For the sake of the restaurant, I'm not going to name it, but I'll say this, they're famous for something, and if you know what I'm talking about, well, you could probably guess it. I was working late one night, night shift actually, and my shift ended at about midnight. I got off a little later because I was waiting for the other person to come in. We closed at 2, and they were supposed to come in roughly at 9, so I had covered their shift quite a bit but I think they had an emergency or something. I can't remember. There was a reason that they had to come in late, but either way, I covered them until midnight or a little afterwards, left, and I got in the car and drove home. On my way home, I passed several long stretches of road where there's basically nothing on either side. No development, no houses, no buildings. It's pretty desolate on this stretch of road, and it was here where I saw something that I can't quite explain. Something, about maybe 100 feet in front of me, jumped up onto the road from the side ditch. It jumped up in the air, landed on the road, stood up really fast, looked over at my car, and then jumped back down into the ditch from the direction it came. It made me halt on my brakes, get out of the car, and think, what did I just see? I even looked around, looked over in the ditch area where this thing had came from because I was so blown out of my mind that I had no idea what this was. It kind of looked like a lizard man, but that couldn't have been, or maybe somebody in a costume. If it was, it was the most elaborate, detailed, high-end costume I had ever seen in my life. I know you're probably thinking I'm crazy for being a girl at 26 years old who gets out of her vehicle in the middle of nowhere at night to go inspect something that she just saw that she wasn't sure what it was on the side of the road in a ditch. But I'm telling you, if this was a person in a costume, 
I was going to let them have it and probably call the police on them for trying to scare a poor girl. But it wasn't that. It was gone, whatever it was. So I don't know what I saw that night. Either I really did see a lizard man, or that was the most acrobatic athletic person in a lizard costume that I've ever seen, with the ability to escape and appear in a matter of seconds. For the sake of the story, we'll call this teacher Mr. Alberts. Mr. Alberts was one of those teachers that everybody knew, and he seemed to know everybody back. Everyone called him by his first name, and he seemed to have the talent of calling everyone else by the first name, even if they were students that weren't even in his class. Well, the day came when somebody had given me a note at the door to hand Mr. Alberts. They were in a hurry, and they told me to give it to him, since they figured I knew him like everybody else does. So, when I went to find his classroom, it occurred to me that I didn't even know what he taught. Coming to think of it, I had never even seen him teaching in a classroom. I had a few minutes before it was time for school to start, so I went up to the first teacher I saw, and I asked him where Mr. Albert's classroom was. He looked at me, blinked a few times, seemingly confused. Apparently, he did not know where Mr. Albert's classroom was either, but he wasn't going to admit it to me as a child. The teacher asked why I was looking for his classroom, and I told him that I had a note to deliver to him. The teacher took the note from me and stepped into a neighboring classroom. Even though I couldn't hear what he was saying, I knew that he was asking the other teacher where Mr. Albert's classroom was, making up some excuse like it seemed to have slipped his mind. The other teacher gave him a strange look that he gave me. It seemed most strange that the most popular teacher in the entire elementary school was a mystery as to what he taught and where he taught it. It wasn't too hard to see him wandering the halls. Come to think of it, that was the only time I ever saw him. He was either on his way to the bathroom or on his way to the office or checking something out on the information board. It wasn't more than five minutes of walking around the hallway that I finally saw him. He had his back to me, so he didn't see me. I called out to him, but he didn't seem to hear me either. I followed him. He was able to cover long distances in a single stride, and me with my little third grade legs. I had a hard time keeping up. If I had gotten his attention, I might not have seen what I saw next. I don't know what made me choose to keep quiet as I approached him, but I was a few paces away from him when he entered a bathroom and he glanced inside and then shut the door behind him, which was peculiar because the only time that happens is when the janitor is cleaning. There was a heaviness in the air that I could not quite put my finger on. Why was it impossible for me to call out to him and tell him that he had a letter waiting for him. I pushed the bathroom door open very gently, just in time to see Mr. Albert's entire body swell up and change shape. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't do that either. His clothes somehow melted into his body as he became green, standing with a posture of leaning forward, kind of like Godzilla, and he sprouted a long and spiked tail that was the color of raw sewage. His head, also elongated, became a mouth full of razor-sharp teeth. It got worse. There was a boy in one of the stalls. Everything happened too fast for me to do anything or get anyone to point to the evidence. Just like that, the demon lizard that had been a teacher tore open the stall and tore the boy to shreds before he could even cry out. Blood splattering the walls and floor, and if I had been any further inside the bathroom, I would have gotten some of the blood on my face. Just as quickly, the monster lapped up the blood in movements far too quick for me to even follow. 
What should have transpired over the course of minutes happened in mere seconds. I ran away, heedless of however much noise I could have been making. I was beyond rational thought in that moment. It was true, fight or flight. I ran headlong into some other of the teachers. One of them, my own teacher, who had seen me in the halls, but didn't see me sit down for class. They weren't sure what to make of my hysterics. I was about to spill details about everything I had seen when Mr. Alberts was right there, behind me, when I turned around. His expression was so blank that I wasn't sure if he knew or not. But he eyed me for a long time, and I kind of shut down on the spot. I told my teacher later about what I had seen, but she did not buy it at all. I doubt she even shared the story with anybody. But from that day forward, I was never ever by myself at school. Not in the bathrooms, not in class, not in the hallways, not anywhere. And every time that Mr. Alberts saw me, he made eye contact firmly and held it. So yeah, it will be easy for anybody to write this off as a child's wild imagination but I couldn't conceive of a kill that grisly and horrible on my own. That man, if he can even be called a man, was wandering the halls, looking for children that were by themselves so he could get a meal, and he could do the deed and clean up the evidence in a snap. And he somehow had everyone believing that he belonged in the building. What was he? I worked for an advertising agency based in a very small town. It's one of those things where it looked like a tornado took a business from downtown Manhattan and set it down someplace it most definitely didn't belong. But we got the business. We brought in professional traffic from outside of town, which helped other local businesses, including the ones we advertised for. I hired on as an intern and eventually got lumped in as a full-fledged copywriter. Our boss was a very strict, and yet somehow very likable, personable older man. We'll call him Max, for the sake of this tale. Max wasn't one for small talk, and just about everything he said was straight to the point, nothing to add, which is the very nature of good advertising but it was strange to see it in a man's everyday speech. Still, people seemed to like Max, and there was nothing about him that I personally had a problem with. Sort of. His eyes, though, they never seemed to focus. He always had that thousand-yard stare that you associate with war veterans, but he had nothing in his office that would ever suggest that he served his office didn't really have much of anything, really. It was probably after three years that I began to notice something. Close to winter, late autumn, when the cornfield behind the office building was very tall, I would notice something odd out in the middle of the field. At first, I thought it was a wildfire, but it never spread. I could tell that it was more like a campfire, very controlled, and never getting out of hand. I wondered why anybody would have a campfire out in the middle of a cornfield. When the field was harvested, the fires stopped. But every single year, when the fields became tall, there were those fires, and they were in the same spot each and every time. I was about to bring this up in casual conversation when one evening... I noticed Max standing out back at the edge of the cornfield. I had assumed he was there having a smoke, but his hands never went to his mouth. He stood, staring at the field. I watched intently as he slowly walked into the field, swallowed up by the stalks that appeared to tower over him. Sure enough, a fire lit in the distance, in the remote heart of the field. After that... I noticed that the fires always came after Max went into the field. So whatever was up, he was in on it. I usually make very safe decisions, never wanting to risk making a bad career move. 
but my curiosity could not be contained. I simply had to know what a middle-aged advertising executive could possibly up to at a fire in the butt crack of nowhere in a cornfield. I wondered if it was an exclusive little club for him and his closest colleagues, but he was the only one I ever saw leave the building for the field. Yeah, I couldn't take it. I brought my terrestrial telescope from home to work, and I waited. The harvest would be coming soon, so I would have only a few more chances to see what was truly happening in that field. The stalks blocked all but the hint of movement, intense movement, just over the tops of the stalks and leaves. There was no avoiding it. I would have to follow him into the field. I thought that I wasn't going to get the chance, but I did. You have no idea how hard it is to move quietly through a fully matured cornfield. It was more of a case of not being as noisy as Max, though he seemed to glide noiselessly through the stalks. But as he did, he also seemed to be changing before my very eyes. But I couldn't get more than a half a second of a visual on him. I didn't see the circular clearing until I had one thin row between it and me. Max stepped into the clearing with several other figures, and my blood ran cold. Max had transformed into something with a head as round as a bowling ball, but comprised mostly of a mouth with teeth like fine needles and small, glistening, coppery eyes. He honestly looked like a dinosaur, trying to be a human, complete with clawed and scaly fingers and a long, whipping tail. He picked up something like a ceremonial headdress, as did his other scaly companions, and they initiated a frenzied, frantic dance around a central fire. One of them broke away from the tornado of movement to pick up a book that looked like a gigantic rotting dictionary. The movements of the others sped up, if anything. When the other creature began to read aloud, as his intonations became more fevered, so did the dancers. I lost track of which one was Max, since they all looked alike except for maybe the colors of the iridescence of their scales. Something about the words made me feel lightheaded. It was a most strange experience. My body was reacting to the sound of speech when my mind was not. Other shapes were now appearing in the air around these lizard men. They were smoky and hazy, but becoming more solid. My instincts told me that I had to get out of there. I was so lightheaded that I felt like I was going to float away. I probably wasn't as careful as I should have been about making noise as I left the field, but I didn't care at the time. I got away, but the strange feeling persisted for a very long time. When I came into work the next day, I was called into Max's office and he dismissed me from my job, citing lackluster quality of work and even worse, work ethic. I won't lie, it kind of hurt, even though I knew the real reason why I was being shown to the door. I'm out of a job and out of an explanation as to what exactly I witnessed. Were those other lizard creatures posing as important, high-level people in other places? I've only heard about reptilian shapeshifters on the internet I never in my life could have imagined them being real as the air that you and I breathe. During my time in service as a ranger, it was decided by the upper-ups that we as rangers should learn how to do elementary tracking, just in case dangerous animals ever decided to run off with somebody's child or something like that. I didn't quite know. Either way, all of us were going to be trained to identify tracks and to follow trails made by both animals and people. Either it was a lot harder than they let on at first, or I just did not have the mind for it. I probably didn't possess the eyes for it either, seeing how my glasses are thick. All the other rangers got their certification pretty quickly, but I was lagging behind 
unfortunately. I don't think that it helped that my progress to any part of that job could be negatively impacted if I didn't pass. And who certifies people for their ability to track animals and people anyway? The entire thing sounded like an excuse to thin out staff. And in hindsight, I believe it was. I got desperate to the point that I was practicing in my own free time. I even tried tracking pets at home through the yard and when I was on break at work. It was one of those practice friends that I found something was very unusual. Most of the wildlife in the park had footprints of a fairly uniform size. I mean, nothing got above a certain size that wouldn't stand out. The largest being the hooves of a deer. Nothing bigger in our park. But I did find something bigger. I just couldn't place what it was. It then occurred to me at the time that they were big enough to be at least be the prince of a large reptile, say like a crocodile or alligator. But that was impossible. We're up in the north. And there's no such kind of reptile that large in this area. There are also no marshes or swamps anywhere remotely close in the area. Nor could they survive in our frigid temperatures or through the winter. Whatever made them, though, was big enough and heavy enough that I absolutely had no trouble tracking it. The trail led me through the woods into a pond where I found looked like a beaver dam, but there wouldn't have been any point in building one in a large pond. It was some kind of nest. I looked inside and saw a collection of large eggs. And they looked like they were stones, but actually about the size of an ostrich egg. I did not attempt to pick one up, but I saw something coming out of the water and made a beeline. At first, I thought it could have been a person, but then I saw that it had coppery-like eyes and scaly green skin. I knew in that moment that I was seeing something nobody was going to believe me in the park unless they saw this animal with their own two eyes. I was even convinced that I wasn't going to get out of this little area alive. So I ran in a blind panic, shrieking for help. I flew out of the tree line and nearly got run over by another ranger. Right as I ran into this other ranger, I turned my gaze over my shoulder to see this lizard monstrosity chasing after me on two legs. Not like any animal I had ever seen. Luckily, the good thing was on my side that the other officer who was driving the car who nearly ran me over saw this creature too. And apparently, as this animal, or whatever it was, saw this other ranger, it hastily retreated. I got the others to see the prince, not the least of which included the people that were there who were supposed to certify me. Well... It was covered up pretty quickly. I didn't get certified. In fact, I got restricted from being on patrol to actually just being stuck in the office part. They told me to be quiet, and I guess I was not allowed to talk about it for the rest of my time working there. I'm telling you now, what I saw defied nature. I don't believe it was an unknown species I believe it was something much, much more. When I first saw those coppery eyes, the thing that stuck out to me the most was the stunning intelligence that I saw. There was something more to it than just a wild animal. I'm not trying to write or chalk up a crazy story. This is just my pure, raw experience. The rest of my time working there, I never heard of this thing again. But then again, we weren't allowed to talk about it or even swap stories without having a very close eye under us. I left that job not too long after, and since then, I've never looked back. A while back, I was working as a journalist for an independent newspaper that I won't name because I don't want my name to be tied to that newspaper and for them to receive any flack or for them to come back at me for defamation. Just want to cover my basis. But I will say, 
we prided ourselves on being completely free of any and all political bias, something that seems impossible for many. But we didn't lean left, and we certainly didn't lean right. We just tried to report neutral facts. But something happened. That's how we reported. No matter who it may look bad or who it embarrassed or who it may look good, we really tried to stick to the no agenda and just facts. We did this by hiring an extremely mixed team of people, leaning on all political sides. While it did cause a lot of discourse, that's not exactly the reason I'm writing this. We had more than one prominent figure try to buy us since we were good at what we did, but we refused to be bought, at least at the price tag that was offered. We had no desire to become anything like the other outlets. You can probably imagine my surprise when I should try and work one day to find out that we had been bought out. The initial news of such thing made me mad, but when I found out who bought us, I was near ballistic. It was another well-known person who was notorious for being very corrupt in business and even in his personal life. Again, if I mention his name, you would probably know him as he has been in the American press, but for the sake of this, I'll keep his name out of it. Well, the situation gets kind of strange. I really felt like I lost my temper. So I'd gone up, talked to my boss, who, by the way, I will remind you that I had a strong, good personal relationship with. I spent a lot of time with this man, so for him to just give up this news outlet was pretty earth-shattering. He kind of just shrugged his shoulders when I asked him about it, saying there was really nothing he could do. But then he made a remark as I was leaving his office, saying that I should decide what to think of the man after I met him face to face for myself. I thought more about it, but wasn't exactly sure what he meant. I felt incredibly suspicious. Look, let me just say I've always been a very factual individual, never giving the slightest acknowledgement to ridiculous notions such as lizard people or anything up the conspiracy alley. But unfortunately, I truly believe now, after meeting this man myself, that the whole term reptilian is a real thing. When he stopped by, we all had a huge meeting with him. And when I got to talk to him personally, shake his hand as much as I didn't want to, I saw what I believe his eyes changed. His second eyelid, it was almost like this reptilian-like membrane. It freaked me out, left me gasping. It was just for a brief moment, but I cannot deny what I saw. At first, I don't think he realized that I saw it, and I didn't say anything, but I kept telling myself I must have just saw things. It must just be a reflection of the light. But then a few of my close colleagues also saw it too, and apparently he tried to hide it very well, and even claimed that there was something going on, like he was sick, or something weird like that. I don't exactly remember. Now, I know this isn't definitive proof that lizard people exist, but it sure as hell freaked all of us out. As far as the company goes, I no longer work for that news outlet, but that story will always stick with me, as there very might well be the possibility of reptilians. After scouring the internet and doing as much research as I could, I have not really found a quote-unquote sanctuary to where I could safely and securely tell my story without at least facing ridicule. I feel like with you, even if you don't believe me, I don't have to worry about that backlash of being called crazy and potentially damaging any reputation I ever did have. Not that I'm necessarily an important person. Let me explain. Two summers ago, I was driving along a highway with my brother. I'm not even safe to say exactly what town we were by, but I was on a long highway right outside of Mississippi. Now, the area where we're going through was kind of boggy, 
there is a lot of thick greenery on both sides, and a thick bog that runs along the right side of the highway. You know how it is down here in the south. I'm not native to this area. In fact, I grew up north, but moved down here much later in life. And that's besides the point. We were driving, and there was no other car on the road that I saw in my field of vision. It was roughly around 9.30pm at night, if I'm remembering and recalling correctly. Again, no other cars on the road, my headlights being the only thing giving light to the road. I think that night, there were either no stars out, or there was overcast and cloud coverage, because I remember the sky being very dark. And that's when both my brother and I, who at the time were lost in deep conversation about trivial things, saw something emerging from the right side of the road, right where the bog was. What we saw rise up run onto the road, and then ran straight to the direction of our oncoming vehicle, was what we can both only describe, which I know this might sound shocking and a little bit not really believable, but a lizard man through and through. It was down to the T, looked like an upright, scaly, walking dinosaur on two legs. I'm talking thick scales, elongated head with huge teeth protruding out of both its lower and upper jaws, large black claws. It appeared to have the figure of a human, two arms, a chest, legs, a very, very long tail, and huge, huge claws, with an even bigger head that kind of did look disproportionate to the size of its body. But that's besides the point. My brother and I screamed, nearly turning the car all the way to the left, going towards the opposite lane, almost running off the road. Why this thing charged at our vehicle, I'm not sure, but we almost drove off into a ditch, quickly regaining composure on the road and hauling up to about 90 or 100 miles an hour to try and get back where we were going. We were scared. We have never seen anything like that in our lives, and we've both been alive enough to see a lot of the world. The entire ride, my brother and I kept asking each other, what was that thing? Did you see it? I saw it too. We would keep checking the rearview mirror, making sure this thing wasn't charging our vehicle or trying to run after us. It never did. As soon as it emerged onto the road, it turned in our direction, and without the slightest of hesitation, immediately began charging in our vehicle at breakneck speeds. The second it probably got within feet of our vehicle, I had already begun to swerve out of the way, and I never saw it after that. So I don't know if this thing pursued our vehicle actively or ran back into the bog. Either way, it's something that will stay with me, and the sight of this thing will never leave my mind. It was hideous and terrifying. 